So I recently picked up this. This is the Lumix S5. And so this is now my B camera to my Canon R6. And you're probably wondering why didn't I go with something like a Canon R7 just to be consistent. I mean, that would be easy. Uh, but I mean, this is something that's really similar in price. Uh, it's full frame and then also has really great dynamic range, if not even better than the Canon R6 and the R7 as well. And Dynamic range, that's really something that really sold me on this camera specifically. And we're gonna talk about that today in this video. Um, but before we do, let's actually talk about dynamic range as a whole. What is it? You've probably heard about it, especially if you're really diving into to filmmaking here on YouTube. Uh, and so dynamic range, just to simplify it, is the measure of information or detail within your image uh, between your highlight regions and your shadow regions. Uh, and so we measure this in stops of light. Uh, and so to give context, the human eye will kind of read out information at around 20 stops of light. Uh, and then you will have cinema cameras that we usually read out around 16, 14 stops of light. And then mirrorless cameras like the S5, the R6, Sony A7S III, a whole bunch will read anywhere between 13 to 11 stops of dynamic range. Really what you need to know is the higher number of dynamic range that your camera has pretty much the closer to human eyesight it will have so just the more detail the more information that it will retain in the image and then the less or the smaller number of dynamic range you have the less detail you'll have so that's really what you need to know uh, and so between the S5 and the R6, there's really only one stop of dynamic range difference between the two. The S5 shoots at 13 stops of dynamic range, the R6 shoots at 12. And so this made me think, so does dynamic range really kind of impact the quality of the image or the cinematic looking nature of the image? Uh, and so I want to try that out today. So I have one particular shot that I set up and I shot it between the S5 and the R6 and then also I threw in a wild card with my Canon T7i which I'm shooting on right now uh, which has significantly less dynamic range than the S5 and the R6 to see does dynamic range really make a difference when it comes to creating again that cinematic style of video or, or video that emulates the movies that we like to watch on the big screen or on our TVs at home something like that so uh, let's dive into it. Let's talk about the shots that I got and again see if dynamic range really is an important factor to creating uh, movie-like videos here on YouTube. Okay, so to set the scene, no pun intended, uh, I shot at that window right behind me and I tried to be as consistent as possible between all of my cameras. So I shot at the same time of day on this gloomy, rainy day. So there might be some changes, but really nothing uh, too significant in terms of lighting changes. Uh, all were shot on 50 millimeter lenses except for the Canon T7i, which was shot around a 35 to get me approximately near that 50 millimeter focal length because of the crop factor. Uh, I shot at f2.8 at 150 shutter speed and then ISO of 800. Specifically because for C-Log3 on the Canon R6, uh, that is the base ISO. Uh, the base ISO for V-Log on the S5 is 640, so boosting up to 800 is not that significant of a drop in dynamic range. Really barely any drop in dynamic range between that. Uh, and then on the Canon T7i, uh, since there's no, v, uh, no log profile, there's no base ISO, so any the ISO I shot at, there should be pretty consistent dynamic range between all of them. Uh, so yeah, again, trying to be as consistent as possible between all three of these cameras. Uh, so let's dive into the S5 and what the image on that looks like. So here's the ungraded log footage. It looks great. You know, there's nice detail in the shadow area and the more highlight region. So in the sky, kind of where those, those branches are blurred out, uh, there's still a great, great amount of detail that is retained. There's nothing really blown out in this image. There might, once we grade the S5 image, we could see a little bit of the sky, to, uh, it's like slightly blown out, but really nothing that significant. Again, there's nothing that really draws your eye towards it. Uh, so I'd be very happy in terms of using this image in one of my short films if I ever needed a shot like this. And then if we jump over to the R6, here's the ungraded footage. Again, it looks pretty good. You can definitely tell that the sky is a little bit more blown out and the shadows have a little bit more contrast, but still a good amount of detail retained there. And again, this is probably due to that one stop difference in dynamic range. Uh, you know, again, the R6 shooting at 12 stops, the S5 shooting at 13 stops. So again, you're kind of seeing that there. And then once we grade it, you can see it a little bit more, but still nothing too distracting. I'd be happy to use the shot again for any kind of short film that I needed. Uh, again, if you want to expose a little bit more properly for the sky, you can stop it down to F4, which I did, and that looks a lot better, but you are losing a little bit more detail in your shadow area, but still nothing too distracting. Again, I'd be happy to use this shot uh, in some kind of film as well. 
Uh, I did also want to test, so the, the grading that I did were kind of roughly Rec. 709 grades, just something really simple that I can put on top of these, but I did want to try a uh, the same grade on both images, so uh, the same grade on one adjustment layer and then putting the images underneath. And so here's what the Canon R6 looked like. Again, I try to emphasize that more gloomy blue hour look. Uh, and it looks pretty good. Again, the contrast on it is nice. I really appreciate the look of this. Um, and it kind of almost takes away from that kind of blown out look in the sky, especially because I lowered the exposure a little bit. So it looks a little bit more natural. Now, if we jump over to the Panasonic S5, it looks a little bit more flat. And that's probably due to that one stop of dynamic range extra. It needs a little bit more contrast in the image. So if you take these image, images separately and you know do a little bit more tweaking on the color grade, you can actually match them up really, really well. So it's impressive that even though these cameras are different brands, different log profiles, you can really match them up perfectly if you just put a little bit more effort into it. And that one stop of dynamic range really doesn't make that much of a difference on it. Both would look great. I could use both of these shots in a film if I had to cut between them, even though they're the same, <laughs> same region. So you probably don't want to cut between them. I digress, but you know, Again, either way, I'd be happy to kind of match cut these shots if I ever needed to uh, and, you know, match them in, in color grading. It might take a little bit more effort, but I'd be happy to do it either way. Um, but now let's go to the Canon T7i. And so here it is at f2.8, ISO 800, and you can see that the sky is really, really blown out. I would say this shot is not useful, even if you tried to recover some of that information in a grade like I did. It just does not look great, so I would not recommend this. If we stop it down to f4, there we go, we retain a little bit more information uh, in those highlight regions. Again, the sky is still blown out, but you can still get some information on those branches outside, but you are losing some information in the shadow region in comparison to the other one. Uh, but this is definitely a more useful shot. In a pinch, if I needed to use this camera and I need to get this shot, I would be happy to use the shot if I needed it. Uh, but yeah, and then, you know, if you want to properly expose for the sky a little bit more so everything isn't blown out outside, uh, you drop it down to f5.6. Eh, I mean, it looks okay, but it's still very, you know, it's very dark. A lot of you, you could already see that, you know, your shadows are being crushed. Even though your highlights are no longer blown out, your shadows are really crushed. So I wouldn't say I would use this in a film. I mean, you maybe could, you maybe could work with it if you needed to, but overall I would say kind of that in between at F4, I think that's probably the best shot, even though some of your highlights are a little bit blown out and some of your, your, your shadows are a little crushed. But overall, you know, I think you could still use this camera if you needed to. But yeah, that's all three cameras. So I guess we kind of have to answer the question that we asked at the beginning is, does dynamic range really matter when it comes to creating cinematic images? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, so, I mean, yes, with dynamic range, it does help us get closer to emulating what our own eyes see. Again, emulating reality, trying to engage the audiences within the stories that we're telling if we're trying to tell a very grounded, realistic story. But that's not always the case. Some films are more stylized. Films back in the day were shot in black and white, and sometimes you really didn't really need anything with high dynamic range to capture those because, you know, really you're focusing on more contrast within the image and having less dynamic range emphasizes that contrast even more. So if you're trying to shoot black and white, you know, shooting on something like a Canon T7i might not be a bad idea, especially if you're working on a budget. So, you know, dynamic range doesn't have to be the main focus there. And then also if you're just starting out in filmmaking too, dynamic range should not be the, the main focal point of, of your journey through this. You know, you gotta work on picking which focal lengths will work best for, you know, your the, the shots that you're trying to get, or uh, also, you know, what lighting situations you need to set up as well. And having something with limited dynamic range might actually help teach you lighting even more because you're working with that limitation and you're trying to figure out how to best light a subject even with that limited dynamic range. So, I mean, there's other things to focus on other than just having the dynamic range um, boost between, you know, having these more expensive mirrorless cameras or a cinema camera, something like that. It helps. It's definitely, you know, eases up some stress, but again, you're going to be learning a lot more by working with the limitations of a camera like the Canon T7i. So again, while dynamic range is helpful, it does help create more engaging cinematic images. I still think you can work with something like a Canon T7i and make some really great stuff. And I've definitely created some films I'm really proud of with this camera that I'm filming on right now, like Walk, like Encounter, like some of my mainland shorts from back of the day. So it's a very capable camera given the lack of dynamic range. So yeah, so that's kind of my take on dynamic range. Again, nothing really scientific, but just really kind of putting to the test, does dynamic range really help create, again, that cinematic look that people are looking for, emulating those movies that we see on the big screen? Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to create some more content soon about the R6 and then, of course, the, the Lumix S5. You know, eventually I'll do a review on that. But until those videos come out, keep creating, keep having fun. I'll see you soon.